Um, like I said, only six verses, and I didn't realize till just today that the past two times that Reuben has asked me to preach on Wednesday night, um, I've done it on Psalms. I didn't, I didn't even think about that, but I did Psalm 73, and I did Psalm 23 uh, sometime in the last eight or six months. And then, you know, this is the worst, at least for me, I, the worst part when Reuben says, hey, can you preach on Wednesday, is it's always sure. You know, I, I love to talk about the Word. I love to talk about the Bible. Um, and you all ask questions, but the hardest part is what in the world do I preach on? You know, and I say preach, it's a half an hour, but I, th I always think, what do I want to communicate, right? And so Psalm 1, I've always, like, and I'm not, I'm not really a... I better be a psalm. I was going to say, I'm not a psalm kind of guy. I better be a psalm kind of guy, right? It's a book of the Bible. But I love the stories of the Old Testament. That's what I love is uh, the Old Testament stories. But my, one of my favorite characters in the whole Bible is David. That's, you know, one of my favorite characters in all of the Bible. And so I, it, it doesn't say if David wrote this psalm um, because there are several authors in the book of Psalms. And usually it'll say a psalm of David before that psalm. Um, so I don't know who the author of this psalm is. Could, could have been David. We don't know. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk about this uh, psalm is partly because of what Oralia said. Is the condition of where our culture is at right now. Um, it's tough to watch. It's tough to open up a newspaper. It's tough to read the news. And, and it doesn't all happen in an instant and overnight. It's something that's just culture-wide. And something that perked up my ears just yesterday, my daughter was, had, had YouTube on, on um, the TV. And she was listening to a song because you just put, you know, you put country music on. And it'll play an hour and a half of country music, or you put whatever you want on. And <clears throat> the lyrics to the song, which I always try and tell my daughter, um, every song has a message. Every commercial has a message. Every TV show has a message. Every movie has a message. Everything is telling you something. And, and then I forget about it, and you know, that's just, you tell them that, and you hope that they remember, and you go on. But the lyrics to the song was very... Um, you know, it just caught my attention and it's about a woman that was cheated on and so she now really hopes that whoever he meets he really falls for, really loves her and that she does the same to him. She cheats on him um, to really just, man, turn the knife. I want you to hurt as bad as you hurt me. And I thought, man, you don't catch that because it's such a catchy tune, you know? And um, I didn't think about it till later that night thinking, what if she really listens to those lyrics? What if she, what message is that song teaching her? You know, I want double the pain that you caused me to, to happen to you. And it's just one example. It's just one example of uh, this constant information that is that we're being bombarded with, whether you're an adult, whether you're a child, um, that you watch on social media. There's social influencers out there, they call them, and they influence people. And so a lot of times, you know, men may see these guys that are really fit and they're going to have the workout for you. Man, you got to do this workout. You got to do this diet. And it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, and women... Uh, have their things. There's makeup ladies that can talk for five hours on makeup and, um, you know, buy this product, buy that product. And you name it, there's something for everybody. You can literally spend 24, more than 24 hours on your phone watching stuff. And so that's, that's separate from the music 
the celebrities, the TV shows, um, the politics, you know, are you red or are you blue? And if you're not with me, then man, forget it. And everything is just bombarding you know, adults at least have a certain, I hope, have a certain level of discernment. You know, that's not a good message. That's a good message. I need to think about that message. But kids is different. You put something to a catchy tune, they will memorize that song in no time flat. Give them an hour, they'll listen to the song three times and it's memorized. And those lyrics are in their head. That's it. Um... You know, when my daughter used to watch Disney Channel, I would, I would, without even knowing it, you know, where did she come up with that? Calling dad, calling me that name, calling mom that. That's where they get it from, you know? And they're kids. They're vulnerable. They're impressionable. You expect that. So you try and control the boundaries of, okay, you know, uh, not going to listen to that. Not going to watch this. Not going to go here. Man, we can't do that forever. And so... You know, what do we have? What's the best tool that we have to combat, is falsity a word? To combat falsity, that's a word, um, error. And that is this book right here, the Word of God that is not going to change. Um, it won't change. And that is 100% Accuracy, it's truth. And, you know, accuracy is how close can you get to the real thing, the truth. That is accurate. So, you know, I wanted to start tonight with um, the way that this chapter <coughs> starts is how blessed is the man. And it tells you why. The last verse, or the last part of this chapter, the last part of the last verse says, but the way of the wicked will perish. And in between a blessed man and a wicked that's going to perish is us. That's, where, that's our life. You know, where are we at? And the main thing is what decisions are we going to choose to make? Who are we going to listen to? Because there's a lot of talking heads and a lot of things, a lot of messages out there that we can listen to and go by. Lots of them. And usually 99% are putting me at priority. I am watching out for number one. What's going to make you happy? What's going to put you on the top? Um, just watch any commercial, you know, it doesn't take long to see that. So, but the fact that we have a choice, sometimes we don't think we do, but we do. And I'll just share a quick story with you before we get into it. But um, I wanted to kind of share the way that I met my wife. And um, because we don't even think sometimes, sometimes we just think this is my emotion. I'm, I'm angry, so I had to say it. Um, I'm passive, so I'm not going to say anything. It's just who I am. We choose and make decisions of who we're going to listen to, who we're going to follow, and who we're going to be. And usually, all of that you're going, your perspective that you're going to form, by the time you're six, six, seven years old, what you've seen from dad, how he treats mom how he treats other kids, what you've seen from mom, how she treats dad. Um, all of these things are already programmed at a young age of what they think is right and wrong. This is the right way to treat, you know, kids. And that's why it's a good thing. I don't want to get off on tangents, but, you know, um, just even for kids to be in the nursery, that's how they don't know they're two years old. They go up and they smack a kid. But that's where you're there to, hey, you don't do that. This is what you do. This is acceptable. This is not acceptable. And you do that and you shape and they pick up so quickly. By the time, like I said, they're six, they already know. You know, maybe some sooner, maybe some later. But, um, yeah, so how I met my wife uh, 
was very late. So I met her at 40 years old, still single. And uh, I was telling my brother, my brother called me and asked me where to get a haircut. And I told him I was getting a haircut over here at Sports Clips. And I said, man, it's not that great. Well, he said, well, go over here at 23rd and Trenton. And they cut good hair. Okay, that one. So I went over there and, uh, and I saw my wife and I thought, that's it, right? That is it. That's going to be my wife. I didn't even know who she was, you know, um, anything about her. So I didn't cut my hair with her that day. Somebody else did. But, of course, you know, my hair grew very quickly, so I was back in a week. And um, so she cut my hair the second time and just made, you know, casual conversation. And um, in that conversation, she mentioned that she had a boyfriend. I probably did something where she probably had to say, man. But anyway, she mentioned she had a boyfriend. And I thought, golly, God, why would you do that to me? Why would you, you know... I'm going to come here. You know she's going to be working there. You know I'm really going to like her. For her to have a boyfriend, hijo de su. And so I was just, so, you know, I did something that I usually wouldn't do. But the next morning I called her at work and I said, hey, um, I just want to let you know that if, if you ever don't have a boyfriend, could you let me know? And I'll never forget. She said, who's this? I said, oh, my gosh. I said, well, you cut my hair yesterday. My name's Mark. She said, well, she said, I cut like 20 men's hair yesterday. I don't remember you. Oh, great. At that point, I said, that's probably the best thing. I'm so embarrassed. I'm glad she doesn't remember who I am. But, um, but I was persistent. And I went back. And I said, hey, I'm the one that called you. Oh, okay. Well, great. Well, we can be friends. Equals the ultimate death. Um, <coughs> the death blow. Right? We can be friends. Ah, no. I said, okay. No, pues está bueno. Um, so a month later, more or less, about a month later, she, the, when I went in, she had mentioned that she had broken up with her boyfriend. I was like, wow, man, that's, I'm so sad for you, you know? So it's just, I'll pray for you, whatever. And so I tried to win her over. And I took some donuts to her place of work. I'm a big fan of donuts. I'm, I'm, sweet bread is my thing. And I thought that would be for her too, right? That's why probably I was still single at 40, right? Oh, that, that says a lot. So I bought a dozen donuts. I took them over there. And that for me was big because I didn't know, you know, it was packed. It was Friday at, after five. And I said, man, I'm really going out on a limb. I'm going to risk it. And I walk in there and just the worst luck in the world. I open the door and, you know, they've got these seats all around the, the edge of the place. And the first face I look at is my younger brother. And he's looking at me like, what are you doing? And I'm holding this bag of, cough, uh, of donuts, right? Because the second time I took off, he said, what are you doing? I turned like 10 shades of red. I ran. I left the bag on the counter and I left. Didn't say hi to anybody, nothing. Just left. So sure enough, it didn't take but two minutes for me to start getting texts from my brothers. Hey, when do we get donuts? And, um, you know, who's this girl? So embarrassed. But I kept going, you know. So anyway, long story short, we met up for dinner, um, went to Jason's Deli, and she was really grieving over this boyfriend that she had just broken up with. And I thought, ah, this isn't good. This isn't good, you know. Um, I don't want to be the, the shoulder to cry on kind of thing. That wasn't where I was at. So <coughs> I prayed a lot, and I wound up telling her that, just, no, just, you know, can't talk to her. And I think it's best that we just don't until she heals. And if she heals, hey, you, know, you never know. So I thought that's the best thing to do. That's what I'll do. And that's what I did. And then I remember a week later thinking, what an idiot. Why did I do that? No answer. Number's been disconnected. Oh, my gosh, I forget it. She blocked my calls. 
you know it's over. That's it. And I said, well, I don't know why God does that. Why would God do that? Five months later, five months later, I get a call from her. Hey, what are you doing? Why'd you stop calling me? I said, I called you a week after we had that talk. She said, my ex-boyfriend had to put a restraining order on him. He wouldn't stop coming over. I had to call up all the police twice, da 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 I had to change my number. And I was like, you know, I was just, what in the world? Anyway, it, the rest is history. So we have two kids, right? Um, and here we are. But the decisions that I made and didn't make, that just, you know, you don't, well, uh, my wife, como, como dice en español, pues es la que me tocó. That's just the one that, you know, that's the one that I, that I got. Well, it doesn't happen that way. You just don't stumble into a person with a, with a ring in your pocket and you become husband and wife. You decide certain things and make decisions. In Psalm chapter 1, is a very, you know, it starts with a man that's blessed and it ends with someone that's going to perish. And in between are choices that we make in life. Um, and some lead to death and some lead to life. So let's just start real quick and we're going to try and... Um, I didn't mean to have a 15-minute intro, but let's try and go through this quickly and see what this psalm is saying. So number one, verse one. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Um, the New American Standard Version how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. We're just going to read through it quickly. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. But they're like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked <coughs> will perish. So back to verse 1. Um, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So... Um, and the other version has how blessed is the one, right? He or she that does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So we have to determine, obviously there's wickedness out there. There's wicked people. Can we determine who those wicked are? Um, the wicked is used several times in the Old Testament. And it refers to the ungodly the worldly philosophies of the ungodly, and we know that there's worldly philosophies out there of, and sometimes you guys hear them, and you're going to see them, you know, usually at the university level, I did, and they teach you these things of, there really isn't, you know, absolute truth. Truth is what you believe is for you, but your truth may not be my truth, you know? That's what they call relativism. Well, that's just what you think is right. Um, that's your interpretation of the Bible, but not mine. Um, the Bible is not even a, 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 a perfect book. It was written by men. So you have all of these philosophies that um, are ungodly philosophies. And that's what this says, uh, who does, uh, the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. He doesn't walk with them. In other words, he's not closely associated with them. Um, he doesn't stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of, of scoffers. Living in the valley, you all know, I don't have to tell you all how many, you know, when I look at those, that verse, I think of corruption. The man that steers clear of corruption. And... You know, how many judges have we had here? How many, uh, 
council members have we had here? How many um, sheriffs have we had here? The list goes on and on and on. In uh, several professions, um, people that just, you know, I, I don't care about the law. I'm going to do this. Um, it's, it's endless. And this here says, bless you, blessed is the man who does not associate either directly, walks with them, or indirectly. He doesn't stand in their path. Um, he doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. I want to go quickly, if we can, to just three verses. Bless you. I want to go to three verses. We're going to stay in Psalm. One of them is Psalm 23, and that's the one that we talked about, or I talked about just a couple of months ago. Psalm 23, verse 3. David writes, He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Meaning, it's not a wire. We're not, it's not a tightrope. It's a path. There's, a, there's this edge and there's this, this edge. And this is where God guides me. Just like I talked about with kids. You want to give them a boundary here. This is not acceptable. This is acceptable. And you want them to have some play area, right? Um, that's the path that God guides me in. And David uh, also writes, go to Psalm 17, 5. Seventeen five says, My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. Meaning, I've stayed on this path, God, with you, with your kingdom, with the things that matter to you. Um, and my feet have not slipped. And I'll tell you why that's important. The last one is Psalm 73, 1 and 2. And then we talked about that one a few months back. Psalm 73, 1 and 2 says, <clears throat> Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. Back in Psalm 17, 5, um, it says, my, my steps have held fast to your path. My feet have not slipped. In 73, he says, my feet almost slipped. Why did they almost slip? Because if you read the rest of the psalm, he was looking around at the corrupt guys and girls, people that were having a lot of success. They were the ones driving the Land Rovers and, and with the Louis Vuitton bags, and they had the big contracts and the big companies, and they had the condos at the beach. Um, and he's like, where's the justice? God, look at what they're doing. And they're living a high life. Man, that's not fair. He said, my feet almost slipped. And I should have gone back. Let me go back to, to Psalm 73 again. Because here's the important part. When, he's, when he says in all of that chapter, you know, they have this, 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 and this. And then it all turns on verse 17. So he sees all of this unfairness, and in verse 17 it says, Until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. When he came into the sanctuary of God, for whatever he saw, his perspective changed. And his perspective was the right perspective. There's going to be an end to things. There's going to be an end to people. This life is short. I mean, I'm going to be 50 in a, you know, a little over a year. I cannot believe 50 years has gone that fast. It blows my mind. So I love football, right? So if I put that in four quarters, let's say zero to 80, because 80s, if you make it to 80, you did pretty good. Every quarter is 20 years. So I went past the first quarter, went past the second quarter. I'm in the middle of the third quarter. <laughs> Okay, which means the game's pretty, you know, it's not too far off from being over. And I don't think there's any overtime. I think that's it, right? The end of the fourth quarter is the end of the fourth quarter. So even if we're lucky, even if I'm lucky and I make it to 80, I'm in the middle of the third. 
Time goes by fast. When he walked into God's sanctuary, he said, you know what? Man, I was thinking about it the wrong way. I thought this is all there is right here. Having the nice stuff. His perspective changed and he had the right perspective. This here in Psalm chapter 1, um, the psalmist is saying, if I can get back to this. Instead of the corruption of hanging out with these people or being associated with them because of something you might gain, his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law, he meditates day and night. Um, I can't tell you how many times uh, I have not prioritized God's word. And that's to my detriment. Because, man, someone that has a relationship with God and knows the word, I'll tell you really, really quick. I got a video just two weeks ago. Um, someone sent it to me and said, wow, watch this video. And it's these two, two men talking about the benefits of reading the Bible. And these two men are talking about this study that was just made. And this study says, you know, we, made, we, we surveyed a thousand people that read the Bible. And here's what the study came out with. If you read the Bible once, Nothing much changes. Once a week, nothing much changes with the spirit of the person. If you read it twice a week, nothing much. Three times, a little blip, but four times a week, the study showed the anxiety level reduced, your stress level reduced, relationship with the spouse was better, relationship with the kids were better. And I thought, what in the world? So let me get this straight. If you read the Bible three times a week, pretty much you can toss that out. But something magical happens if you read it four times a week. All these things turn out better. <clears throat> and I thought, you know, if I'm not a believer or a young believer, I'm going to think, shoot, well, if I read the Bible, all I got to do is do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and that's it. My life is going to get better. My relationships are going to get better. And I'm telling you, that is such a popular message today is what is God going to give me? It's not what I, man, I want to know who God is. Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins, what I deserve, and I get to go to heaven and have a relationship with God. I want to read his word and know who this God is. Because I want other people to know. It's not that. It's if I read this book, well, these good things are going to start happening to me. And that is incredibly popular and incredibly wrong. It's no longer about who God is. It's what is he going to do for me? And what can I get out of this? And I thought, man, that's just... Oh. You know, and may, hey, <clears throat> maybe if people read it four times a week, God can change their perspective. Maybe they will fall in love with God. But the motive of if you do this, God's going to give you this is so uh, unbiblical. And it's everywhere. And that's another one of the worldly philosophies when it talks about the counsel of the wicked. You do that, God's going to do this as if he's just a genie in the sky. You know, he's there just to give and give us and give us and give us and give us. And give, instead of us, man, God, you did that for me. I don't deserve to be called your son. What can, how can I live for you? It's not that. Anyway, um... So I just thought I'd share that because it, that, that video just, man, but it, 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 you know, you play a little piano music in the background and forget it. You're like, that's it. I'm going to read the Bible four times a week. Um, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. 
I had a picture. Did anybody give you a picture, Sam or Monica? It's, oh, anyway, if they can get up there, great. If not, no big deal. But that's just a picture. You know, every year my family and I get with our brothers and we go camping in Lakey. Okay, that's not the right. Was it on the, is there another picture, Sam, or is that the only one? Okay, it's the only one? I think it was in, it's on another file. Anyway, it was a picture of the river in Lakey and these massive trees that just grow alongside of this river. But you can leave that one on there, Sam. I, I, I took that one for a purpose, too. But uh, these trees that grow alongside the river are just, I mean, you look at them and you think, those things aren't going anywhere. They're so big, you know, I don't know how big around they are, but they're massive. That tree right there is massive. If you're ever, that's at North 23rd. And when I was thinking about this verse, I thought, man, I got to go take a picture of that tree. North 23rd, if you're traveling south to north, it's right before you get to Ferdy Gonzalez, which is south of 107. Um, you'll turn to the right, and there's an irrigation canal. So guess where that tree's planted? Right by a stream of water. And just go look at the base of that tree and how massive it is. Just, I don't know what can uproot that thing, you know? And the blessing that that tree is for anyone wanting to be under the shade, any of the animals that can live in that tree, fruit, let's say it was a fruit tree, the fruit that that could give, it's a blessing to so many people. As opposed to, um, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. I mean, what is a tree without any leaves? Does it help anybody? Or there's no fruit on it. There's no shade. Trees aren't, the birds aren't going to nest in there. There's nothing there. It's just a tree. At one time it had leaves because it says whose leaves does not wither. So at one time it did. Um, but not anymore. The wicked are not so, but they're like chaff which the wind drives away. You're gonna, if you do a little, just, just put chaff in your, in your phone Bible. It comes up many, many times in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it always, God just burns up chaff. It's useless, it's worthless. It has no value. Um, and that's what it says the wicked are. They're like chaff, which the wind just drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. So number one, there's going to be a judgment. Um, and the wicked aren't going to stand. They're not going to have, um, they're not going to be able to take on that judgment. And so it says there's not going to be any sin sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Um, I can't stress enough the necessity to be in the Word of God. And it's not because if you do it, God's going to do this magical thing for you and everything's going to be great. To know the heart of God and the mind of God and what and the truth that it is. This tree right here, and that's what we have to, I have to learn. I love to say we, and it's me. To get away for living for myself and think about other people. What can I give to my wife? Um, how can I really love her? How can I really love my kids? Do I realize that I'm being an example to my wife and my kids every day in how I handle life? If I come home and just, you know what, I'm tired, I'm watching YouTube for two hours. That's sending my kids a message. It's sending my wife a message. If I just go crazy, hey, you know, I had a hard day and just bang on them and be aggressive, that's sending them a message. And we as Christians, 
you know, let me go really quick to six. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. A lot of times we think that we can act those ways and just, well, man, but if you read God's word, God knows there's nothing you can hide from God. Nothing. Not even a thought in your mind. Nothing in your heart. Everything is visible to him. He knows the way of the righteous. Um, and he knows the way of the wicked. And that's why it says the way of the wicked will perish. Uh, God sees everything. And we have to have a clear perspective. On one hand, if God sees everything, he's going to give me, give me, give me. Because look what I did. On the other hand, man, I can't do anything wrong because God sees it too. And so you're going to have two extremes. The healthy extreme is God died to pay for my sins and he's accepted me. I'm accepted by God. Am I perfect? Of course I'm not, I'm not perfect. But he loves me and he wants what's best for me. So um, I want to end <coughs> with Matthew 24, 27, because, uh, well, let me go really, really quick. Let me stay in the Old Testament and go to Joshua 1, 8, because God, this was a turning point in the time of Israel when Joshua was going to start preparing to go into the promised land. And God thought important enough to tell Joshua these things. So Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 God tells him, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. That sound familiar? You know, it, it sounds kind of odd. Make sure you read this book and you know this book, you think about the words in this book day and night. That's what God told Joshua. Joshua had a, he was going to lead the whole nation into the promised land. And God didn't say, hey, you better make sure, man, go do push-ups, 300 push-ups a day. Uh, make sure that you're eating right. No. Know my word is what he told him. In the New Testament, uh, we'll end with this. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Verses 24 through 27. Matthew 7. 24 through 27. <coughs> and Jesus is, uh, is saying a little parable here. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and, it, and great was its fall. That house is someone's life. That's your life. If you don't put the words of Jesus, the words of God into practice, you're going you're gonna to follow something else. Money, fortune, Peace with the spouse as long as my spouse isn't mad at me. Peace with your children as long as my kids aren't mad at me. I'll give them, I'll give them whatever I want. It's, that's bound to fall. Okay? We've got to trust Jesus' words, the word. John chapter 1 verse 1. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Um, I don't, I know, I don't spend enough time in the Word. I, and I, you know, 
You get busy. Everybody gets busy. I have to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. I'll tell you, I can spend half an hour on the cell phone like that. I'm not too busy for that. But, man, it's just so hard to read the Bible. There's just no time. And we make excuses. And again, please don't hear me to say, don't read God's word out of guilt. Um, don't read it because of what God's going to give me. This is 100% truth. Um, and it's for, it's for life. And just remember, you know, the part about the fruit, just start. Think about how you can be fruit because people need it. Your spouse needs it. Your kids need it. Um, your, maybe your friends and family need it. And you know people that just man, are miserable. You have God's word and you have the spirit of God in you. Even if you start badly, start because you can build on that. Maybe you go and tell someone and you think, God, oh, that was why did I say that? I shouldn't have said it like that. You said something. You, you told your, your child something that, you know, that's going to impact them. You look them in the eye and you told them something. Uh, just, you know, we, I need to start. I need to really, like it says, delight and meditate on the word of God. Um, we can be a blessing to others. And like I said, some of you all, maybe you're not in the midway in the third quarter. You're younger. Don't waste time. We only get one life. That's it. That's all we get. And um, hopefully we're pouring into other people and putting ourselves behind our egos and what we want. So let my life be the proof, the proof of you. Yeah!